traditionally when um, Division five had has subsections as well, and we have EMS, Educational Measurement and Statistics, and you can tell which one I belong to, right? But we also have an assessment um, section, and there are other assessment sections in other parts of the American Psychological Association. And our next speaker is very involved in all of them, um, and of course is one of the co-authors of some of the, um, the essential uh, textbooks on assessment. So we're very, very pleased to have with us Susanna Urbina. Emeritus Professor of Psychology in the University of North Florida, to muse a bit about psychological assessment, its past, present, and future. Susanna? Thank you, Amy, for that overly generous introduction. <laughs> to exaggerate a bit, but <laughs> what? Can you guys hear me? Okay, well, I was very, very happy to come for the first time to ETS a place that was sort of like uh, Oz for me <laughs> when I grew up. <laughs> um, Amy asked me to address the role of assessment in our field, especially in terms of distinguishing its concerns from what we typically discuss in the measurement arena. So she could not have asked me for anything more to my liking. Uh, our field, the Division Five field, deals with methods, both quantitative and qualitative. Assessment, as I understand it, is the applied branch of psychological methods. Like all other areas in our discipline, it has undergone profound changes since I entered it in the second half of the 20th century, and it continues to evolve at a very rapid pace. Today, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the past, present, and possible future characteristics of the field, of psychological assessment as I have experienced it and as I foresee it evolving. But first, I have to clarify some issue, uh, issues of semantics that has been problematic uh, for, for me and for those who actually engage in the practice of psychological assessment in clinics, in schools, and various other organizations. And uh, I, I think I, I will uh, make that uh, clear. Let me see. Uh, I'm going to start out then by uh, defining, uh, again, in my view, and I keep fooling around with this definition, what psychological assessment is. Uh, and then I'll talk about how it differs from testing or measurement. Psychological assessment is a flexible process, not standardized. It's flexible. Very, uh, very important difference. Testing is standardized. That's part of what a test is. Um, so psychological assessment is aimed at reaching a defensible determination. That is very important because very often people who do psychological assessments end up in court for some reason or another. And it's necessary to defend what you have concluded. Um, it concerns psychological issues or questions. That's what defines psychological in the part of assessment because there are many, many other types of assessment. Uh, and it can pertain to one or more individuals. And it's done through collection, evaluation, and analysis of data that is appropriate to the purpose at hand. Differences between testing and assessment, or test and assessment. Uh, degree of complexity is one major difference. Uh, the kinds of questions that are asked, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, when somebody's brought for, a, for an assessment um, are, are very different from uh, the questions that are asked uh, of tests to explain. Although I think that tests are evolving in the direction of assessment. I think that is clear from what we heard this morning uh, from uh, Randy Bennett and, and, and others. Um, the duration uh, of testing and assessment, usually an assessment lasts a lot longer than a test session. Several hours is not uncommon, sometimes days. Sources of data uh, obviously uh, differ. Uh, in, uh, in assessment, we use uh, many, many sources of data, uh, including, of course, tests. But as a primary sor source most of the time, but not always, not always. It depends on the question. The cost uh, assessment is far more costly than testing. Uh, 
uh, and that is one reason that you don't do as much of it or that it isn't done, it, it isn't done as much. It costs, in terms of time, uh, a great deal. And in terms of expertise, it, it requires people who really know what they're doing, not only about the, the tools that they're using, but also about the areas that they're doing the assessment in, and <coughs> those kind of areas we shall see. The degree of structure also varies. Tests are usually very structured. Assessments can be structured more or less uh, depending on the person doing it, but usually are less, less structured. The uh, procedural basis of testing and assessment differ. In testing, objectivity and quantification are the procedural basis. In assessment, we use objectivity, we want objectivity, we use quantification, but judgment is also involved very, very importantly. And the focus differs in testing and assessment. In uh, testing, uh, usually the focus is how one or more persons compare to other people or to some criterion, or simply sometimes how much of a particular content they have learned. Uh, in assessment, the focus is not on any of those things, but uh, how to answer a question that is unique to that particular person, group, or situation about which the assessment is, is being conducted. So uh, I am not very familiar with this way of doing things, but I uh, think this is my name. Can you read that? Is that too little? Um, these are examples of uh, test purposes. They're taken from uh, the Mental Measurement Yearbook's uh, online uh, database. <laughs> a plug for, for uh, K uh, Kurt's uh, place of employment. Uh, the, I, just, I just chose four different kinds of tests, and I just took the, uh, the purpose that is listed as the, the first thing in the, in the short version of the, uh, of the mental measurements. Okay, uh, the alcohol dependence scale provides a brief measure of the extent to which the use of alcohol has progressed from uh, psychological involvement to impair control. <coughs> That's it. Uh, the Beck Anxiety Inventory measures the severity of anxiety in adults and adolescents. Campbell Interest and Skill Survey measures self-reported interests and skills. Graduate record examination designed to assess the verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and critical thinking and analytical writing abilities of graduate school applicants. And uh, the Wexler abbreviated scale of intelligence uh, is a short and reliable measure of intelligence in clinical, psychoeducational, and research settings. Now for some examples of assessment purposes. First of all, you have classes of different uh, questions, as you do with testing as well. But you can have diagnostic questions and uh, uh, here, of course, a complication is that uh, the basis for uh, diagnostic determinations keep getting changed by the psychiatrists <laughs> from time to time, but you have to have a good notion of what you're talking about if you're going to deal with diagnostic questions, especially differential diagnosis. Uh, one question would be differentiating between depression and dementia. Um, these uh, present with uh, uh, sometimes, or very often actually, the similar symptoms. Uh, depression can, of course, create, create forgetfulness and so forth. Uh, I have, uh, when I was doing psychological assessment, uh, seen people for whom this, this question had to be answered. And that's the only kind of assessment that I like to do is when there was a question that was difficult to answer. If it was a routine thing, you know, just go and get me a lot of test results and report on your test results. That wasn't very interesting. But this question is really very difficult, especially in the elderly, of course. And I, I'll never forget, never forget a, a unique case of a, of a widowed, a recent uh, widowed woman and she was exhibiting, uh, you know, memory problems. Um, she had left a, a pot on the stove or some kind of thing like that. 
and um, so uh, I was, I, it was, she was referred to me for differentiating whether she was depressed from her recent loss of her husband or uh, whether it was a case of dementia. And uh, I spent a, a good bit of time with her. And she, she certainly had uh, some forgetfulness, but not, you know, it wasn't clear. It, it was a case where I just simply never could come to a conclusion. I had to say that in my report. I remember this is the only case in which I ever do, did that. I knew where she lived, and I drove around her house to see if I could see her, to see if I could get one more bit of information about her life. Not to, not to contact her, just to kind of observe some more. And I, I really couldn't. And she probably was having both. Uh, and so that, that was my conclusion, that I couldn't tell whether it was uh, primarily, that, that the time would tell whether, uh, depending on whether she got better in terms of her memory difficulties or continued to get worse, whether it was one or the other. But that is the kind of uh, question that is interesting in assessment. Uh, determining an individual's level of cognitive functioning and also uh, just everyday life pragmatic functioning. Uh, an interesting question in this regard that I had also in my practice was um, from a couple who had a son who was a late adolescent, early adult age, and he was mildly retarded. Uh, had been diagnosed as mild retardation. Um, and uh, the parents wanted to know, from my assessment, their question was, uh, after examining, did I think that when they died, this young man could make it on his own? Or would he need to be taken care of by uh, siblings or by an institution or what? Um, that kind of issue is, is the kind of thing that can't be answered by a test. You have to have various uh, sources of information. Uh, other kinds of questions as a, that assessment are geared to are making predictions. So these are the hard part. Uh, estimating the likelihood of suicidal or homicidal behavior as well. That is really <laughs> the toughest, toughest thing. Assessing an individual's capacity for independent living, that is sort of like the one I was just mentioning uh, about the young man. Uh, evaluating the probability of someone's success in a given job, uh, that is not as hard depending on whether you have a good job description and, and so forth. Um, and then there are assessments that are geared to making evaluative judgments like helping a court in making child custody decisions, a very litigious area of uh, practice because depending on what the findings are, one or the other one of the divorcing parents uh, ends up being unhappy uh, a lot of the time. Uh, assessing the effectiveness of pro programs or interventions. And there, of course, the key thing is uh, what did that program or intervention try to do, what was the goal of that, and that having that clear is uh, sometimes a problem. And then uh, sometimes you got referrals for uh, just having some kind of treatment planning, how do you, how do you see this case? Uh, in some cases, for example, uh, therapists might be kind of stuck uh, on, on, on a therapy case and they uh, uh, would would send them for assessment as to can you find anything through your test usually that can help in breaking this, this junction where we're stuck. Anyway, those are, as you can see, very different kinds of goals than the goals of test. And so um, just very quickly, before you decide to use a test, if you're an assessment person, you need to know the following things. What information do you want to get from testing? And can the test give you that information? How will this information be used? What will be the consequences of your getting this information? You need to think about that, I think, as a, an ethical practitioner of assessment. 
how much, if any, of the information that is needed is already available from other sources. Uh, what tools besides tests might be used to gather the necessary information? And there are all kinds of other ways of finding out things. What are the advantages of using tests instead of or in addition to those other sources of information? And what are the disadvantages or the costs of using tests instead of or in addition to other sources? Those should not be definitive, obviously, but they are consideration. So what other assessment tools do we have? Um, biographical data, case history, biographical data is an essential for, form of information in almost every case. Interviewing, uh, and one of the things that I did when I, when I did my practice is a lot of psychologists who do psychological assessment uh, give it to uh, technicians to, to uh, administer the tests and, and even sometimes do the interview, although they usually do interviews themselves. I did everything. I did the testing. I, I, you know, to me, the, the Wexler, in addition to being a, an intelligence scale, was also a, a dyadic interaction from which much information could be uh, gathered just in terms of observing. And that's the kind of thing, for example, that you have to have absolute mastery of the procedure so that you're not worried about. <laughs> like when I taught individual intelligence tests and I was teaching my students how to give the Wexler scales, well, they didn't know <laughs> what to do next, how to score, and blah, blah, blah. Now, some of that is being handled now with the iPad versions of the Wexler scales, but um, you need to know exactly what you're doing so that you're not even thinking about it and you're um, ready and able to observe how the person is going about. Uh, you know, some stunning things happen. For example, people who do better on digits backwards than on digits forward. Uh, <laughs> that you would see on the record, but there are other things you can observe that are very interesting. And if you give it to somebody else to do, you don't have it. Well, that comes under the rubric of that next uh, assessment tool, which is very important observation, uh, systematic or naturalistic. A lot, for example, in child custody cases now, a lot of um, the assessment procedure consists of observing the child in interaction with the parents, one or the other or both. So, uh, and that's a, a very good source of um, qualitative data. Records are great source, academic records, employment records, medical records, legal records. And uh, in, in some cases, collateral information from relatives, teachers, and supervisors. With the widow lady that I told you about, she lived alone. So that was a problem. That's probably why I ended up <laughs> driving around the block around her house, because there wasn't anyone there in her home who could tell me more about her behavior and symptoms, possibly. So, uh, needless to say, validity data on these tools is not always available. So, uh, I'm going to say things that you, some of you may not like, but I have five reasons for not using tests. Uh, and there, there are reasons. When, uh, and remember, I've been a teacher of testing, so uh, this would not apply to all those people who are expert. In, uh, in tests, but if you don't know what you're looking for, what the purpose is, you should not use a test. This sounds stupid, but so many people come around and say, what should I use? Uh, what, I, I have this thing, what test should I use? They don't know anything about testing, and they, they just want an answer. Uh, when the test user is not completely familiar with the necessary test documentation and procedures, like Kurt said, for example, the lack of manuals, I really think that that's a problem uh, because <laughs> if you don't have a manual, you know, you have to look for sources of information about it and that's a more complicated problem. But if you're gonna use a test, you need to be completely familiar with the documentation, all the research data, whatever it is that has been used, not just necessarily what's in the manual, a lot of it is in the literature, and it may apply to your purposes more than what's in the manual necessarily, so. The test user doesn't know where the test results will go. I think that this is a, another ethical uh, 
think that can be a problem, or how they will be used, or cannot safeguard their use or their security. Uh, and uh, that might be a problem to in forensic type assessments, which I didn't really like to do because they're fraught with difficulties in the ethical area. Um, when information that is sought from the testing is already available or can be gathered more efficiently from other sources, you should not test. Uh, and when the test taker is not willing or able to cooperate with the testing, needless to say, that would be not a good uh, thing. Guess what? Five more reasons. <laughs> uh, I will have some reasons for using tests. <laughs> I know I don't, I don't want to be known as the anti-testing person, but uh, there are many reasons for not. Um, if the test taker it, it may incur some harm due to the testing, and there, of course, it's a relative judgment. I, I don't mean just test anxiety, I mean some harm. Uh, uh, if uh, the environmental setting or conditions for testing are inadequate, I, I've seen people doing testing with a noise around them. <laughs> You know, they're going to get, they're going to get garbage. They're going to get not good things. Um, if the test format or materials are inappropriate for the test taker's age, sex, culture, or all linguistic background, disability status, or any other condition that might invalidate test data. Now there are some uh, uh, efforts to remedy this by providing tests that are appropriate for different uh, types of people, but uh, still you have to consider whether the one that you have in front of you is, is, is um, available. Uh, I stopped doing psychological assessment quite a while ago, and, and I was asked, uh, because I knew I was uh, uh, from a, from a Spanish-speaking country, uh, to assess people who were only Spanish speakers. Well, at that time, I really couldn't find a test that I could use for the purposes that they wanted that was in Spanish. Now, now it would be different. Many more have been translated. Or there were things like the IWA that uh, Kurt mentioned that were really not good. Uh, then, uh, if test norms are outdated, inadequate, or inapplicable for the test user, obviously not a good thing to use them. And if the communication on the reliability or validity of test scores is inadequate, and it's important important here to think about reliability and validity as uh, attached to test scores as opposed to tests. Uh, and there is uh, obviously a, a difference. Uh, the the reliability and validity figures published in the manual uh, are are from trials that were done in the process of uh, uh, producing the test and uh, they cannot necessarily be taken to apply to every case. Three important reasons for using tests. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> efficiency, efficiency. All told, psychological testing provides tools for gathering information uh, in a timely and cost-efficient manner. If you had to observe a person, uh, I always started my courses by saying if you wanted to know uh, about a person, uh, uh, really know them, you know, you would have to marry them or be their best friend or that sort of thing. Well, with a test, you can cut to the chase a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, objectivity, test data derive their meaning, meaning and value from their uh, normative or criterion reference based uh, frames of reference and uh, from the accumulated evidence that has uh, been gathered on test score reliability and validity. Uh, incremental validity. Uh, even if you have some data already, uh, tests may add to the prediction of the criterion beyond what the other sources of data can. I think, okay, uh, I, I jumped over. Oops, oops. Ay, ay, ay. What am I doing? Wait, no, no. I got it. I got it. Okay. I think I went. Yeah. Sorry about that. There's not much more. 
I'm going backwards now. Yeah, I keep. Yeah, change of set. This this decreases with age. <laughs> Changing set capabilities decrease with age. Okay, now I got another one. It, it's not working that one. Oh no, I don't want to end the show. I don't know why I have this. Uh, Clicker. Yeah, clicker. There it is. I haven't been using the clicker. That's okay. And I don't. Use, I usually don't use touchpad. Uh, okay, hold on. Okay. There we go. There you go. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Past, present, and future. It came up again. Um, okay. So now, just go to the past, present, and future. How am I doing on time? Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh. Well, I was going to go through a lot more than this, but my earliest experience with psychological uh, assessment dates back to the 1960s in my graduate school days at Fordham. Uh, needless to say, things were rather primitive then. Psychoanalysis still prevailed as a method of psychotherapy and also, also as a method of test interpretation. Uh, in, uh, in studying projective techniques, for example, um, the draw a person test was given as an example, and interpretations of dubious and possibly counterproductive value were proposed um, about the meaning of belts in, in human figure drawings, for example, and the sexual uh, possible problems that that indicated, etc. cetera. Um, uh, some, uh, Results of even the Wexler scales were overinterpreted. For example, VIQ, verbal IQ over uh, performance IQ, or performance over verbal being indications of lateralized brain damage um, without regard to base rates or other neuropsychological data. Uh, okay, as far as the present is concerned, I'll just move on to now. Uh, the areas that are thriving in terms of psychological assessment are therapeutic assessment. Uh, people like Constant Fisher, who started uh, uh, this trend pretty much. Um, some uh, inklings about that earlier, but uh, she started it in more recent times. And then, of course, um, Stephen, uh, oh God, I've lost his name now. Steve. Finn, Finn, at the University of Texas. He's. Um, He's the guru in thera therapeutic assessment. He runs the Semper Center for Therapeutic Assessment at, at Austin, not at the university. He used to be there. But he uh, has uh, developed a semi-structure system of collaborative assessment. And uh, it's become a major center for research, training, and practice in this type of approach. Uh, he uses standardized techniques. But the major focus of his system is to make the feedback the client gets from psychological assessment therapeutic in itself. And uh, it is, it's really a very, very viable way, I think, of conducting assessment. It, it deals with the problem I always had of, when I did assessment, of being sort of in, an, in a judgmental pose. Well, if you do th therapeutic assessment, you're in a collaborative pose, not in a judgmental. Uh, neuropsychological assessment is alive and well and thriving, especially uh, in specialties like uh, sports, uh, where concussions are frequent and assessment for the results of concussions um, uh, in terms of uh, functional disability uh, are beginning to be really understood. This dates back, uh, neuropsychological assessment is relatively new specialty, dates back to the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, and there is a profusion of instruments, some of which have problems in terms of their normative basis, uh, because they have, a lot of people just do a study on this and collect some data and use it for their purposes, publish it maybe, and it may not necessarily apply to others, for example, uh, with the waste, uh, Mayo uh, developed an older adult sample uh, going uh, as high in age as the 90s before the waste uh, Wexler scales themselves, the adult scale 
went up to that age. Now they do, but before they did that. And it was a select sample in terms of educational attainment. So it, the results of those, those norms were not really very good for the general population of uh, older adults because they were a select group. Anyway, uh, things like that. But it, that is thriving. Forensic assessment in light of our litigious society is, is being done for a number of purposes. Uh, evaluation of competence to stand trial, evaluation for civil commitment, guardianship, uh, insanity defense is a big one, compensation for mental injury, that's an interesting area of practice, child custody evaluations, et cetera. Uh, even though it's a new and thriving field, uh, there is, or maybe because it's new, it's, there's need for further development and better training opportunities in forensic. Uh, if I had somebody who wanted to go in the field, I'd probably tell them to go into that. IO uh, always has been, a, uh, for a very long time, an area where assessment tools are used. And now there's a resurgence of assessment center ratings as a tool in IO. Uh, assessment training has been lagging, but I read a report by Reed and Vig in 2014 that over the past decade it has generally been stable and increasing. So uh, I don't know exactly uh, what the current situation is, but uh, obviously it's critically important. And it's critically important that the assessment methodology is taught and also the content area that the person is going to work in because it makes a great deal of difference in what field you're going to carry out your assessment. Occupational, educational, clinical, forensic, etc. And the last thing that I have here, and I don't know about the slide, maybe I can just do enter for the next, no? Yeah, okay. Uh, for the future, the answer will be, I think, integration. This is an article that I just read in Psychological Science. Uh, it's integrating new genomic discoveries into the into psychological research about antisocial uh, behavior. Um, not only a multiplicity of psychological methods or behavioral observation methods, but even uh, genetic information combined with that uh, I think will be something that will be used in the future to assess people. In other words, uh, getting their bio data, bio, biological data, not, not just biographical data, and their psychological and behavioral data. And I think that it's gonna, it's gonna go to that. Uh, another recent thing uh, is uh, this idea of uh, Jose Hernandez Orayo. Uh, who uh, is uh, currently at Cambridge on a fellowship. Uh, his book, The Measure of Minds, is a very interesting treatise. If you have a um, chance to look at it, um, he wants to uh, understand the nature of intelligence, in particular, in all its manifestations. And he proposes a universal measurement principle of intelligence that could be applied with equal validity to machines, humans, and other animals. And um, what he proposes is an algorithmic information theory as a foundation for a universal psychometrics in which the key measurement unit will be the logarithm of the number of computational steps necessary or something, and that in turn could be used as an objective measure of difficulty. I, I just think that that is terrific. Squeezes from today's presentations, I think, are also all leaning toward toward integration from Randy Bennett's. Uh, I gather that the question is, uh, are tests really going to be assessments, real assessments? Uh, from Michael Keynes, uh, are the problems we have had in clarifying validity due to the fact that we are worried about validity with regard to tests rather than with regard to what we should be worried about, which is assessment, which is the real, the real problem, not just a uh, uh, limited question, but a more general question. And from Mark, um, are items to test as tests are to assessment? Just something to think about. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry.